Okay. Uh, hello to everybody out there. Um, welcome to History Matters. And I do this every time. I should be smoother. And so does coffee. This is a coffee cup, which will be revealed at the key moment. Um, this week, uh, as advertised, we're going to be talking about um, the filibuster. Uh, and we're going to be talking about, first of all, what it really is, what it's for, like, what good is the filibuster? Um, I almost named this session that, like, why? Why the filibuster? So we'll be talking about that and how it's changed over time, um, because I think, like so many words in political debate these days, it's getting tossed all over the place and people aren't really thinking about what it means and definitely not what the history is. So even I, like, in, in doing my deep dive to get ready for this discussion found out a lot more about it that I didn't even know before. However, before we plunge into talking about the filibuster, I turn to my partner in crime, Matt, who will explain the rules of the game. And good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, rules of the game are as follows. We like you to use chat to engage in conversation and frivolity and all great things associated with the program. We just ask that you please uh, keep it family friendly and germane to the conversation to the best of your ability, but please do use chat. However, if you do have questions for Joanne, we will do our Q&A here in a few minutes. Um, if you do have questions for Joanne, make sure you put those in Q&A. Um, that's where it's a lot easier for us to make sure we get all get to as many questions as we can um, from the Q&A section. Uh, a reminder, because Tom's not here, is <laughs> that if you are um, if you do choose to use chat, please make sure to select all attendees and panelists. So it's not just going to Joanne and myself uh, and it's going to everybody. And as always, if you do like what we do here at the National Council of History Education, uh, please uh, visit us on the web at www.nchteach.org and check out all the content. We have some uh, lots of new content popping up on the website right now. Um, everything we have a we have a, a new video section which we're adding in um, and eventually podcast but right now it's just videos uh, we have two series uh, both it's called one's called in service to in service of history education um, which are we're, we're dubbing uh, uh, history education TED talks is the best way to put it we have two up so far cool. and then we also have um, from our vault where we select things from programs that maybe folks are not a part of um, and we have one up from our LEAD program, um, which is a program that we do with Osceola County teachers through the Department of Education. Uh, so check that out. We also, of course, have uh, lots of other content up there, including the link for the Sarah Vowell talk. If you happen to miss the Sarah Vowell talk on, on Wednesday, she was wonderful. It was a really, really good time. Leanne Potter, our moderator, was, was terrific. So um, definitely check that out. You can, that's in our um, webinar archive section. And then last thing I want to, of course, mention is that we do have our conference coming up in just a few weeks now, starting on April 8th, April 8th to the 11th. If you have not signed up, you should definitely do so. Uh, it is a fantastic opportunity to hear from colleagues um, and um, historians. We have great keynotes this year. We have great virtual field trips this year. Um, and then, of course, we do have our wonderful fundraiser, which we want to mention here, which is uh, History Matters and So Do Cocktails. Uh, <laughs> Joanne and I are scrubbing the um, cookbooks from the past to find the best historical drinks uh, available. I will find one. I will find we, one. We will find something uh, appropriate for the conversation. And uh, it should be a wonderful time. And that is going to be our one year anniversary to the show. Uh, That's amazing. 15. And we will do we will do something celebratory also during our regular yes. slot. Yeah. But that is kind of a, a, a an extra bonus celebration of the fact that we will have been doing this a year. Yeah, it's going to be really fantastic. So uh, so come check us out. Uh, you don't need to attend the conference to, to go to that. So um, tickets, I think, for are eight dollars and twelve dollars. So eight dollars if you're going to the conference, twelve dollars if you're not. Uh, and we encourage everybody to come by and um, yes, bring your fresca. So. <laughs> Fresca, right. acceptable. So I'll turn it back over to Joanne for our conversation today. Excellent. And I will point out the fact, you may not be able to hear him yet, but um, Newbie the Rescue Parakeet is quietly oodling off. He's, he suddenly became happy, Matt, when you began speaking. So that's for you. Okay. So we're going to talk about uh, the filibuster, which is being talked about all the time these days. 
often without much context, often without much explanation. So that's really what I want to do this morning is that. Let me move this here for a moment. Hang on a sec, folks. There we go. Okay, I think that'll be better. Okay, so, um, and I think when, when you say filibuster, probably what most people think, uh, or certainly is what pops into my head, is Mr. Smith goes to Washington and the famous Jimmy Stewart um, scene where he's doing a filibuster and he's speaking, I think, for 24 hours, hour after hour after hour, and sweating in his shirt sleeves, and it's dramatic, and filibuster, right? And I think uh, Wendy Davis in 2013, uh, Wendy, Senator Wendy Davis of Texas, when she did um, what I think was a 13-hour filibuster um, against an anti-abortion bill, wearing her famous pink sneakers. Uh, again, that's sort of in the Mr. Smith mold. Um, and I didn't necessarily remember this one, but it deserves mention because of the number of hours involved. In 2016, actually, my Senator Chris Murphy um, did a filibuster on uh, a gun control bill uh, that was proposing background checks and um, not giving guns to people on government watch lists for being a suspected terrorist. I'm not going to comment on that, but um, he stood up to defend that and it just under 15 hours that that he managed that filibuster. So that's our image is, you know, certainly it's my image and I think it's probably the popular image of people holding forth as long as they can possibly hold forth. And then when they collapse, the filibuster ends. But that's not all that it is, and particularly nowadays, um, it's more complicated than that. But before we plunge into that, I want to mention um, just a few things about the Senate that are worth knowing, um, because they're going to expl explain in part why the filibuster has the power that it does. So in the Senate, first of all, um, everyone has the right to be heard. Every senator has the right to be heard. They don't all, I mean, obviously they still need to compete to get attention to speak, but they all deserve the right to speak. And until everyone who wants to speak is recognized, typically um, you can't vote. In 1917, they, they switched the rules up, but you still need a lot of people to shut someone down <laughs> in the Senate um, from debating. Um, senators, generally speaking, can't be interrupted without their consent in some way. They can speak only once on a single question, but they have unlimited debate, basically. They can talk, say what they want as long as they want, and that was deliberate, right? Partly deliberate um, from a constitutional kind of structural um, way of thinking. Uh, the Senate was seen as the body that's checking the executive, and as that body, as that um, institution that was responsible for that it was seen as requiring broad reach and and you know extra bonus power uh, so that it the people in the Senate the senators could effectively check executive power and then also it was seen as an upper body that was supposed to be you know of different character from the house and was probably going to be the place where there were greater debates happening the house is a very different institution so all of those things are true Given all of those things, filibusters, what I just said, uh, filibusters can work. Um, they can, but the, the main point of a filibuster, and, and this is what I'm going to come back to because it's not just speaking as long as you can speak. Filibuster really is just about, and this is obvious, delaying. It's obstruction. That is what a filibuster is for. It's delaying action on a bill. It's delaying voting. It's delaying something by using parliamentary tools. And that's something I wrote about a lot in my most recent book was um, rules as weapons, right? And that's in one way or another, that's that's been something that has been happening um, aggressively since the early 19th century, but in some ways or another always, but it's really the early 19th century when people figured out, huh, we know how to do this better now. And I'm going to mention the first filibuster in a moment, which was in 1837, which, which tells you about the moment when people really figured out the fine art of obstruction. But at any rate, that's what it's about. It's about delay. Um, and not surprisingly, and it's one of the things that supports it, and it's something that people yell when discussion is had of eliminating it, it's a tool of the minority. So if there's a majority that wants something, a minority can block things using the filibuster. And that's, you know, the, the sort of righteous 
minority rights, you know, that people come up with. Um, and that has a power to it, which I'll come back to as well as to one of the reasons why um, I, people think twice about abolishing the filibuster. But I also want to talk before we get into the dirty, nasty details about where it basically comes from. It does not date back, uh, and actually it's not in the Constitution, does not date back to the founding. The person most responsible for it, and it was basically created by accident, um, this somehow is delicious, Aaron Burr. <laughs> Aaron Burr gave us the filibuster, not on purpose. Um, apparently when he was vice president, he was presiding over the Senate. Um, there is a thing that you could do in the Senate, call the previous question, um, which was the way that a majority could halt debate. They could say, I call the previous question. And then you immediately basically had to check in and take a vote on whatever was under debate and it cut off debate. And it wasn't really used very much in this period. As I was saying earlier, um, true like ongoing power obstructionism is more of an early 19th century um, gesture. But in this period, Burr looks at the rules. He basically argues in 1805, one year after he killed Alexander Hamilton, that the Senate, looking at the rule book for the Senate, there's just too many rules here. Many of them are never used. They seem irrelevant. And there's this one here about previous question, like why do we why do we really need that? That's the, we don't use it. We can eliminate it. And there wasn't really a loud protest, but in eliminating it, that opened the door for really aggressive filibustering, which doesn't happen, poof, in 1805, but that opening, that gap is what allows really aggressive filibustering into the Senate. Um, it, it, so it's possible. It's not common. Um, people are still experimenting with how to deploy these rules, which is always a thing that I love about um, working on the founding period is it's uh, experimental, improvisational kind of nature. Like, what if we do this? What if we do that? I find that fascinating. In 1837 was the first filibuster. Um, in 1841, it became associated with the South. And this is a point uh, that I'm going to make about more than 1841. But in 1841, another person who, um, maybe not equivalent to Aaron Burr, but not beloved, John C. Calhoun. <laughs> so John C. Calhoun, in 1841, um, there's a bill to charter the Bank of the United States or to recharter the Bank of the United States. Calhoun arranges a stream of Southerners offering amendments to vote it down, one after another after another, to just delay things until summer adjournment, at which point, oh well, I guess we can't recharter the bank. That was noteworthy because it was so organized, because it was lengthy, and it's John C. Calhoun. Um, so an important thing, and this is actually something that scholars of the filibuster, which there are, um, and I'm going to come back to the name of one of them who I'll mention because she's really the authority on it. Um, but people who think as even I at times have been given to think in writing my last book that the 19th century is the great age of senatorial oratory. Um, it was, it was a great age of oratory generally in the United States, but Already in that period, there were people trying to naysay and eliminate the filibuster, right? Already people were saying, oh my God, like this, this is going on too long. It's not useful. Um, so it, there was great debate and there was also this brewing controversy about how much debate there should be and should it be this much and should we call it off? Um, apparently there were attempts to bar the filibuster, which were filibusters. <laughs> so, they didn't necessarily happen. However, um, and this gets back to my previous point about the South, um, a notorious period for aggressive use of the filibuster has to do with the civil rights debate uh, in the United States in the 1950s, 1960s, when Southern senators basically used the filibuster to block civil rights bills, right? which makes perfect sense. So it, it kind of gets a Southern conservative um, tradition. There's, there kind of ends up being seen as a Southern conservative tradition. Um, and that's true. Again, Calhoun kind of sets it off and, and that undercurrent continues. 
Um, by the 1880s, going back for a moment, almost every Congress had at least one bout of obstructionism, but given what I just said about Southerners, Civil Rights Acts, by the 1970s, um, things were getting filibustered quite a bit, and they came up with a, a what do I want to call this, a sort of understanding, a revision to the way that the filibuster proceeded. Uh, it was decided that if you made it known that a bill was likely to be filibustered, then the um, uh, vice president or the, now I take that back, then the um, majority leader could put it aside until other things had happened. So basically, so that there would not be, um, all work would not come to a standstill in the Senate, people grew to accept this custom of people stepping forward and saying, mm, that's going to be filibustered. And once that starts, nothing else is going to get done. And so this custom evolved, like saying, oh, this is likely to be filibustered. I, as the majority uh, leader in the Senate, will put it aside and we'll do other things. And then we'll deal with the fact with the filibuster, the filibuster. I'm sorry, guys. I not, have not had enough coffee this morning. Syllabuster, silly buster. Um, we might have to work on revision, revising the, the term. At any rate, um, now there are many ways to filibuster. As I suggested at the outset, it's not just Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Um, there are silent filibusters as I just suggested, when people kind of suggest there's going to be a filibuster and that kind of silent filibuster means something is set aside. McConnell, Mitch McConnell, this is no surprise, has used that more than anyone before him um, and basically using proceduralism and this kind of genteel rhetoric of Southern resistance um, to really hold power in the Senate and, and sway what gets considered and what doesn't get considered. And just to give you a sense of numbers here, between um, 1969 and 1970, there were six filibusters. Between 2018 and 2019, there were 168. Between 2019 and 2020, one year later, there were 298 such filibustering moments. So it's booming strong and Mitch McConnell is a big force behind really getting the filibuster to be used more aggressively than ever in this kind of silent, well, we're not going to consider it because it's going to be filibustered way. Now, this brings us to an obvious question. Why not just eliminate the filibuster, right? If it's in the way, why not eliminate it? And there are a few reasons that people tend to use. One of them I mentioned already earlier, minority rights, right? You can certainly step forward and say, you need the filibuster because it's a tool, it's a weapon of the minority to have power during debate, to make its will known. You can't eliminate that. Along with that goes the, but what happens if logic of eliminating the filibuster? So you do something now while you're not in power. And then when you are in power, the minority uses it against you. So eliminating the filibuster has consequences and those consequences inevitably are going to be turned against you so that's part of the logic and actually in this is an example of that in 2013 there was a revision made to the filibuster and this is worth noting because it means that can happen right there was a revision made that said judicial nominations will be exempt from the filibuster Right, and that was allowed to happen. It it was um, Democrats who made that revision. Um, later, it was Republicans who have been using it to deal with judicial nominations, push them through. Well, you can't filibuster this person. So there's a flip already in in from party to party and how it's being used. Another reason why people don't want to eliminate the filibuster is, um, you know, we've heard people talk about the nuclear option. And one of the reasons why they choose that word and have used it in the past to refer to this kind of a change in congressional rules, the nuclear part of it isn't in the use of it. The nuclear part of it is in the reaction. So it's a nuclear bomb because you do this and there will be an explosion on the other side. And that then we're just gonna be focused on this. It's gonna be a big mess. It's gonna make things even worse. So there are all of these reasons why people 
press against eliminating the filibuster. Um, I think a lot of them have to do with fear of what happens when the roles switch of who's in power and who's out of power. We, we are seeing now some talk of reform. Um, people uh, talking about, as with the nominee re revision, right, that maybe there are ways we can tweak it uh, so that it can be used but can't be as effective. It's trickier than it might seem. It's easy to say abolish it, but in the um, researching that I was doing last night and this morning about this, um, it, there are very logical reasons that are frustrating but logical as to why eliminating it might be detrimental. Now, that said, a counter argument is that eliminating it just makes things more democratic, right? And, and the fact of the matter is, there actually was initially a filibuster in the House, which was eliminated, um, partly by um, the famous Speaker of the House, Thomas Reed, who, um, I got to find his quote here, he has a great quote. Um, he hated it, right? And he was a brilliant um, maneuverer and reviser of the rules of the House. Uh, so around 1890, when he's talking about the filibuster, he says, quote, I made up my mind that if political life consisted of sitting helplessly in the speaker's chair and seeing the majority helpless to pass legislation, I had enough of it and I was ready to step down and out. And what he does, so at that time, one way in which people were obstructing and blocking things and in that sense delaying and filibustering was you could say that you, if, if when there was a vote, people would vote yes, people would vote no. But even if you were present, if you chose not to vote, you weren't there. So what that meant is you could have, you know, a, a quorum could vanish because there are people in the room, but they essentially by not voting, they weren't there. So Reed pulls the carpet on that and, and there's a, a vote and someone refuses to vote and basically says, you know, I, I'm not here. And Reed says, you saying you're not here? <laughs> like, I see you here and I'm going to count you as here. It was a norm that allowed that to continue for so long. And, and the, the interesting thing about that moment is there wasn't a parliamentary way to rein in the speaker from saying you're in the room, you're here. So suddenly the rules change. Apparently there was one congressman who was so eager to not be present and, and not allow the quorum to happen that he kicked in a door <laughs> to vanish out of the room and other uh, members of the house were kept in because they were trying to run away so that they would not be present and the same thing could happen that there would be no quorum but reed is the one who manages to basically defeat the filibuster in the house the senate um in a way it's more characteristic of the senate given what the senate is supposed to do um and as mitch mcconnell makes amply clear um or has made in the past it's a really effective tool and one of its most um, powerful uh, props is the fact that congressional sessions end, right? So you can filibuster and filibuster and filibuster and, and sometimes that means holding it off and not allowing it to be there for debate and then a session ends. So if you could filibuster until that moment, poof, you've delayed it at least until another session. So it's, it's parliamentary maneuvering there's a tradition of it. There are reasons to at least think about what happens if you eliminate it. There are consequences. And then there are good things that can happen, right? I mean, there are very good things that can happen. More what more might get done. <laughs> you know, I mean, people will figure out other ways to practice obstructionism. But um, there's a big logic to the people who are saying it needs to be eliminated. Um, so, but you can't argue anymore that it can't be since it was in the House. You can't argue that it can't be reformed because it has been reformed before in the Senate. So the question is, what's right to do now in this moment? I do not have the answer to that because I am by no means a master of parliamentary rule. I just think about John Quincy Adams as the ultimate master um, of parliamentary rules, and he used them to full effect when he was in the House. Um, so that bit of expertise I cannot offer you, but the context of it and the tradition of it and the background as to why it's a big deal right now and some of the reasons why people do or don't want it to be eliminated, that's what history can tell you a lot about uh, in the background to this moment. 
Um, I'm going to stop there. I I'm going to bring Matt back in. I'm actually going to now move um, my chat box so that I can see what you guys are saying. Um, <clears throat> and I can see, yeah, um, moving to adjourn the house. There are all kinds of ways in which you can delay, delay, delay. So there is a broader obstruction custom. Um, OK, so Matt, welcome back. Hello. Hello. Oh, oh Mug. <laughs> Donna said it this time. Not normally isn't it Carolee, but Donna. Yes. OK, so um, I struggled this morning. Like, I do not have a filibuster. <laughs> appropriate mug and I and I was going to go for a Hamilton mug because of his six hours in which during the Constitutional Convention I thought well that's not quite a filibuster but it's in that tradition however when I opened my cabinet I saw this telling about the South <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so in the broad tradition of Southerners using it to fight against civil rights bills this is the mug. It is actually an appropriate mug. I'm vaguely proud of myself <laughs> for thinking of it. And and now, so those of you who might be new here, we do every week somehow I find a mug that is appropriate to what we're talking about um, and reveal it after I'm done speaking. Matt has a background every week that is related to what we're talking about and is revealed mm. at this moment. Indeed, I have seen no guesses. I thought I thought even Joanne might have a have a guess at this one. This is... Well, it it looks UVA ish. That's it's it is it well it's colonial actually. Ah okay. Um, so I I don't I don't think this part of it is new. I think this was an addition, but oh interesting. This is um, it's colonial. Yeah, so this is actually I actually thought you might get it because it's in New York City. Um, <laughs> this is uh, the Aaron Burr House. <laughs> Yeah, in New York City. Wow! Oh man! I, I, I thought I maybe. I should have guessed I, that one. I think if I had, if I did it from the front, you probably would have gotten it. So I picked up a, a, the uh, the patio picture, which I really clever. Liked. Yeah. So, oh, very clever. So this is the Aaron Burr House, who, of course, as Joanne mentioned, this. I kind of love the fact that we can blame him. Yes. <laughs> I, I was thinking about this today. Like, can we legitimately blame? Uh, Aaron Burr for uh, really a lot of America's colonial problems. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but is, can, here's can another he, point. You can sort is of he like the new scapegoat? Like it used to be Benedict Arnold, and now it's no, nah, he can't. Burr. He he has he he was essentially pro women's rights in his own way. Right, so, right. You know, I always say to people like I, I sometimes I'll get a good feeling of hate towards some figure in the founding, and then I'll discover something positive like. Um, Timothy Pickering of Massachusetts, I thought was really a weaselly, nasty kind of guy. And I really, when people said, who do you hate? I'd be like, oh, Timothy Pickering. But he was a really good father. He had a, he had a son, I believe, that had some kind of really serious learning disability. And the effort he went through to get the right schooling for his son, as I was reading the letters, I was like, damn, I can't hate Timothy <laughs> Pickering. I can't, I can't hate him now. <laughs> okay. Anyway. But I think what it, what it points out, though, is that these... These people are are really complex <laughs> human beings, and we need we we forget that in in history sometimes, right? Like we we like to kind of pigeonhole them as one thing or another, and in this case, you know, Aaron Burr, yes, Aaron Burr is responsible in many ways for the filibuster, but unintentionally so, and there, he has a lot of other great qualities, even though he, you know. Well, people will punch you for saying that, but let's. I, I know, I know. Lin Mal Manuel Miranda will like unfollow me on Twitter. No, he doesn't follow me on Twitter. But um, yeah, no. I but it's it as a as a history educator. That's why I always try to convey to teachers is we need to stop this narrative of of these historical figures are one thing or another. They are deeply complex. They are human beings, and and that they're blobs, the right? There's yeah. a founder blob. What do the founders think? Right, yeah. What are the founders? Oh my gosh, yes. That sh that, that should be uh, one of our new TED talks. Is the, why that's such a bad. It should be actually. <laughs> it should be anyway. Okay. Anyway, moving on. Questions. Now, folks, I see five questions in here, and as always, my threat is, Which is alive. Not a anymore. threat, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which is uh, Joanne will have to suffer through my questions if uh, if you don't uh, put in your questions. So. Um, 
And okay, I'm gonna start with Mary Beth's question. Um, and Mary Beth, I'm going to to tweak your question to a historical one and a current one. So her question reads, who would you say are the current ma masters of parliamentary procedure? So I wanna tweak that to say, you've mentioned John Quincy Adams, who, who else in history would you say was a master of parliamentary procedure in your estimation? Um, and who do you think currently does it really well? Well, I mean, you know, I, I am not, um by any means an expert on the specific maneuverings of people in Congress. I do think that Mitch McConnell, it's obvious I mentioned it, has been doing it mm -hmm. very effectively, frustratingly um, for quite some time. And in his case, just putting things aside, right? Um, yeah, I see people saying Robert Byrd was a, was a master. There have been any number of people, um, but not a lot of people. And, and so it's key to note that being a parliamentary master is not... Um, an easy thing. I mean, if, if so, you know, just looking back to the period that I know better with John Quincy Adams, it's not like he was in the what well, and he was in the house, but it's not like he was in a room full of people who could do what he did. As a matter of fact, um, the guy who's kind of the pseudo narrator of my last book, Benjamin Brown French, one of the things he describes doing he would be at, at, up front taking notes and doing whatever he did as clerk, and people would come up to him and ask him questions about the rules representatives would come up to him and like, mm. can we do this with this? Can we do that with that? Because they didn't know. And French, who'd been sitting in and watching things forever, did. So Adams, by having that knowledge, really had a weapon that most other people did not have in that way. And so you get a lot of, when people really deploy the rules with that much effectiveness, and, and if they're doing it effectively, it's hard to not, to, to sort of get away from their plan. It, you know, you get a lot of the congressional equivalent of why I oughta, right? Because people can't act, they're being held back. Uh, so basically it, it's it's a more powerful weapon than you might think. It, it sounds, parliamentary procedure sounds like exceedingly boring and something that you write about if you're a very specialized political scientist, but um, it absolutely shapes the culture of Congress. And actually, that that reminds me, I meant to mention it before. Um, a scholar who's written a lot on the filibuster um, and who actually spoke um, before a congressional committee about it recently is Sarah Binder, B-I-N-D-E-R. I don't happen to have her book here, um, but if you're curious about this historical context wise, she would be the person to turn to. Yeah, I, I got to say, I'm, I'm, I'm actually a huge nerd. I love parliamentary procedure. You know, like I, I and I love the distinctions between, you know, Robert's rules of order and Mason's rules of order, which are used in different. So I like I, I kind of like that part of it, but well, there's a, lo a logic to it, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. Speaking, the, the point of having the rules and to have them regulated and written down in that way is predictability and mm. fairness, seemingly right that that um, and although what I find interesting is seeing them deployed in modern bodies that are not legislative. So like um, Yale faculty meetings. Yeah. Yale faculty meetings deploy rules of order, right? So, you know, do I hear a call? Do I hear a second? You know, Madam Chair, there, it, there's like a formality, mm -hmm. uh, which I kind of love because it's like, it's the rules, right? It's the way you go ahead and everyone knows that that's how you proceed and people aren't talking over each other. But the first time I went to a Yale faculty meeting and saw these rules of order being imposed, I have to say it was like, it felt like the most Yale-y thing I had ever seen. I was like, wow, that's, <laughs> I don't know what I thought, but I thought it would just be a meeting. But there's a, a there's a powerful logic to it. The only thing that would make that more Yale-y is if the whiff and poofs were there singing. That's <laughs> That would be true, and that yeah. would be scary. But <laughs> no, that's that's true. Like I, so my, I do some side work um, with school boards, and so like that's, it, it's it's not fun. Fun's the wrong word. Somebody's calling me out. Clinton is calling me out for calling it fun, but it it is for me like helping people work through problems in a logical way can can be powerful. And I saw somebody mention the parliamentarian you know, that having that role is separate, I think it is, is separate, or excuse me, is, is kind of a, 
interesting way for Congress to think through that whole parliamentary process. Well, it's so. essentially it's essentially what Benjamin Brown French was. Right. He sat off to the side, he took notes, and people asked him questions about the rules and eventually asked him to write a rule book because mm -hmm. he was that guy. So yeah, it, 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 there is a reason why. And, as, and a separate person seemingly not in the middle of debate might be able to be fairer, although obviously nowadays with partisanship. It gets problematic. Yeah. Um, Cecile wants to know, um, what, are, what, are the, what were the political ramifications after it was abolished in the House? Were laws commonly overturned or changed with shifts of po in power? Well, as far as I could tell, and again, I you know I hesitated in choosing this topic because I am not a master of all facts filibustering. Um, but as far as I could tell, in the House, there were not dire consequences. There was more that got done. Um, you, but again, the House is a different body with different rules, so the impact would be different. And some of the things I set out at the beginning is to um, the Senate and debate in the Senate would make the abolishing it different there. But in the House, there wasn't a dire outcome. And I think in a sense, um, it was a little bit more democratic. Um, and I think it was a little bit more productive. I wish you could make the exact equivalent argument about the Senate, but because the fundamental rules of the Senate are so different, um, you can't make that direct um, relation between one House and the other. And I apologize for stepping away. I, am. I was like, Matt, come back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm here. My, my three-year-old we discovered late last night does not have school today. So um, so he, ah, he's okay. in the next room. So I'm doing dad duty as we as we work through this today. Um, let's see. OK, so Dave asks a couple great questions. Um, and I'm going to ask the, the, more, the one that you probably are a little bit more familiar with, which um, I think would be an interesting addition to this conversation, which is, didn't the founders collectively fear direct democracy? So state legislatures and elected senators. Can you talk a little bit about that that fear? And I, I know I know this idea of direct democracy does come up pretty often in the Federalist Papers. And yeah, um, that might be a, a an area to talk about. Yeah, no, and it, and it's true. Um, it, it's um... It's one of the weirdnesses about Hamilton being a hero right now is that he was not particularly comfortable with democracy. So it's a little problematic. But the fact of the matter is the, the founders, when they thought about democracy, what they were thinking of was Athenian democracy. What they were thinking of was um, a, a pure democracy was a government in which everyone is taking part. They were okay with representative democracy, structurally speaking, but they were not comfortable with the idea of pure democracy and many of them were not comfortable with the idea of mass ongoing interaction between in, with the public and politics. So, you know, when there are crowd actions, it's, it's Hamilton actually in the Federalists who are particularly unhappy with that. One of the big things that's being debated in the 1790s is how democratic a republic is this or, or should it be? And you have one party, one side, the Federalists, that are saying not, not that much. <laughs> now, you know, it's important, and I always say this to my students, to note that um, when their way of using democracy and our way of using democracy is different. Nowadays, with a lot of words, we tend to toss them off as, as sort of um, catchphrases, right? Democracy, liberty, freedom, you know, the words that we use to represent America. Um, so on the, on the one hand, I tell my students they're not allowed to do that because words have meanings and if they're going to use them, they have to think about the meetings. Uh, but democracy, maybe more than any, is just like, and maybe freedom too, right? Democracy, freedom. Um, in this time period, it just wasn't that. To the point that um, even Jefferson worries about, you know, the, the power of mass democracy and what it might do. And he's kind of Mr. Democracy in his spirit for what he wants government to be. Less surprisingly, Hamilton's last letter before the duel, I think it's his last letter, not the second to last letter, um, is a letter in which he's sending out a warning um, through a friend because he hears there's talk about New England seceding from the Union uh, under Jefferson's presidency. And Hamilton in the letter says, the foremost enemy of the Republic, the thing that will destroy us is democracy, 
right? That's his final statement. So it's one of many ways in which, as a historian, I can say it's not good to, to project back in time and assume direct parallels because they don't exist. In it, for folks who are curious about this in a broader way, um, my American Revolution course is online. And the first lecture is something like Freeman's five rules of studying the American Revolution. And, and one of them is words have meanings and they meant something different back then. I think you can find that lecture if you search on um, Yale Open Courses History um, 116. Uh, and, and Freeman. Um, and it, it talks about a lot of things like this, things that you can't make direct parallels to when you're looking at the founding, which we all tend to, and which totally warp how we understand where we started versus what we evolved into being. Um, I'm going to turn the conversation away. To, we're we're going to go off on a tangent here because it's an important one. Okay. Um, Vicky asks, I'm curious about your research process as a historian. You say you aren't a filibuster expert, so how did you prepare for today? Did you automatically know what books to consult? Did you use Wikipedia? To describe your, please describe your process. This is important because yeah. we're, and, and we said this famously on several episodes, like we know lots, but we don't know everything. Right. And, and, and so the, the process really does matter. So Joanne, yeah. can you talk a little bit about? Sure, and, and I'll also say we haven't done this really yet because I've been really focused on democracy, but at some point, I think we really should do a, a how versus a what kind of a history mm -hmm. matters about how, how one does something. But as far as filibuster, um, the first thing I did was go to this. <laughs> the book that I had on filibusters. It's a political science text, so it proved less useful for my uses this morning than I wanted it to be, but mm -hmm. it gave me key years and key names and a number of other things that I could then begin to search for. Um, I knew Sarah Binder was an expert and you can get a lot of things online. And then I found her, her um, address to this congressional committee on the filibuster and the history of the filibuster. So that was useful as well. Um, I've actually been saving, um, not necessarily for today, but I was saving um, articles on the filibuster because I thought sooner or later I'm going to have to talk about it. Um, and so I read a number of these that I had saved that were lengthy kind of think pieces, you know, thought pieces about the filibuster. One is in the New Yorker. Um, one, well, the New York Times had an extended one. One was in the Atlantic. That was the other one um, that helped me kind of know what the main issues were. Um, and then I searched for um, particular things that were I knew would turn up interesting points. So, for example, I know generally speaking that um, James Madison was very worried about um, the the minority, the the power of the minority, which is directly related to this. So, I searched on you know James Madison minority rights or minority Congress or whatever to see what I could get. Um, I searched on a couple of the other sort of specific things that I found in these books. Uh, in scholarship to kind of see what I could get. And the thing about, um, someone says, I just had the book handy. Yeah, <laughs> it was back there. Um, yeah. I just wrote a book about Congress, guys. So there's a lot of stuff back there. Um, and I knew when I woke up this morning, I was like, I got a book on the filibuster. I knew I got a book on the filibuster. Um, but but the, my larger point here is it's a snowballing effect, right? So you start with, or I start with something that's clearly authoritative so a scholarly text about uh, whatever it is you're talking about so that you can trust, generally speaking, the facts in it, and you can glean the notes and the text, um, partly to get a, a full understanding or at least a structural understanding and partly to get a clue as to where to go further. And then using those clues, you sort of begin to snowball your research. The important part for students, because I think they, um, when you ask, when they're researching something, they just go online and start, you know, playing games. And I talk all the time about the the Joe's garage method of research, which is, you know, they'll give me a paper and, and there'll be some random website. And I'll say, do you know who this person is? Is it Joe sitting in a garage? Why are you, why do I care what Joe thinks in mm -hmm. his garage? Like you have to think about where the information comes from. So what I just said is a great example of that, right? I, I start, with authoritative texts. Yeah. This one was more political science-y, so it didn't give me what I wanted, and I was sort of like, Pew. But um, between that and Sarah Binder, I, I could start off. Um, and so, you know, in preparation for this, which is why, as I've been speaking today, um, I 
don't have some of the specifics of it down, um, but I do have enough to know the general history of it, the consequences of it. Um, there's a lot of debate, obviously, on what happens if it's eliminated or reformed. So it's I think research is kind of a snowball-y kind of a thing. I've been I've been talking to um, my students about this last week, um, who are starting research papers, uh, and they're you know I said well go to the newspapers of the period and and search on key words uh, as a starting place, and you know of course there's a logical question well what's a how do I know a key word and I kind of along these lines I'll say you know well think of something that you know has to do with this and search on that and see what words they use in the article and what what words are floating around and look for words that uh, to you seem strange um, that you'd never think of to use. And if you search on those very often, and, and if you look at conventions, you know, I think I was just talking to someone yesterday about this and saying, you can't search on Mr. Hamilton or Mr. Jefferson in newspapers because that's not how they're often referred to, or, right. or, and let me put change that. You can't search for Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson um, because the, their first names aren't used. Sometimes it's Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Jefferson, but first names, the, the temptation is to search for the full name. That's not going to help you any. So you have to start out by looking for something about, that you know about so that you can judge the truthfulness of it and then use it to kind of translate that moment for you so that you can actually find what you're looking for. Yeah. and. And I'm seeing a lot of comments about the the Joe's garage, um, <laughs> and if you're and if you're one of my former students, I, I refer to that same phenomenon as um, Uncle Bob's house of internet research. Was, was what I, <laughs> I that, that, so if you've been in one of my classes, I've said that before, but um, <laughs> it's a very very similar idea. But I, I think it's important, to, and I just if it's okay to take a two minute tangent here, Joanne, yeah. just because we do have a lot of teachers that do listen in, you know this is a really important conversation because when I've gone into classrooms and I work with teachers, I see this phenomenon where the teacher says, okay, research this, like, and they get on their little Chromebooks and, but the, the direction is research this or research, whatever. And invariably, just like you said, kids go to Google and put in something and then they get Wikipedia or they get, you know, um, uncle Bob's house or, or Joe's garage, right? Like, <laughs> There's no, and it's so important to, as teachers, be really direct about A, what constitutes a valid resource, and B, how to go about finding that information. So those of you who are teachers out there, please, please, and I'm happy to give you strategies on this later on, because I don't want to interrupt the show too much here, but it is such an important aspect of what we do is helping our students, whether they be kindergartners or seniors at Yale make really good decisions about what counts as as good research. Right? And we've, we've talked about this before uh, at some point in the last year. We've now done this so long that I don't remember when we talked about things. But the larger idea, along with what Matt is saying, that um, particularly at this moment in a, you know, there's a fire hose of lies swimming around us, it becomes a, a civil duty, right? It becomes like something a citizen needs to know how to do um, is to evaluate evidence, to think about what's authoritative and what isn't authoritative, to do a minimal amount of poking around before drawing conclusions. Um, and, and even, you know, I'm sure some of you out there like me are tempted, like you'll see something on Twitter. I do this all the time and I'm like, what? And I have to sort of pull myself back and be like, Freeman, open the article, read the article, you know, 90% of the time, what I was objecting to actually isn't there. Um, but it it becomes like a really um, politically important in the sense of being um, democratically important, I'll say it that way, skill uh, to preserve or substantiate or hold up to bolster democracy um, by teaching students, you know, to, to really think about evidence and its authority. And, you know, if people ask you like, what, so what do you get with a history degree? One concrete answer is we are like the masters of teaching people how to think about evidence and how you can draw conclusions about it. And we are at a moment where that, that kind of expertise off the charts necessary. So for all of these reasons, yeah, I, um, it, it is important. And so, yeah, that's what I did this morning. <laughs> by Joanne Freeman. I was like, I know something about the filibuster. I know the issues. I know these two books. 
and I shall begin. <clears throat> and in case anyone's curious, I, I did the same thing. I, I but um, I, I looked at perspectives on history at for AJ, the American Historical Association, and uh, there's a interesting article on Brookings Institute, which also is was helpful to me. So, um, okay, let's get back to. We have about eight minutes. Let's get to a couple more questions here. Um, so Connie asks the getting back to our filibuster. So we get back to our our, our more specific conversation. Yes. Um, Connie asks if the filibuster was created as a delaying tactic. It doesn't seem to be that anymore. It seems to be a bill killing tactic. Should that part be changed? Should there be a time limit? Should like like how? how well, I, it, I, 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 yeah. I think, so I think delaying could often become killing. So I, I don't think those two categories are necessarily entirely separate. But I also think, um, and I again, I can't speak authoritatively. Now see, think, look for the authorities. I can't speak authoritatively about the impact of the of reforms at this moment along these lines. But given that, you know, there has been reform in the past, um, a question is along the lines of what you're asking is that is, can there be a reform that makes it more delaying than, than killing? Is there some way to tweak it uh, so that the kind of delaying it does is is reined in? And I don't know the answer to that, but but I think anything that can delay things until the end of a session <laughs> becomes a killing measure. Uh, it just depends on how aggressively you're using it for that purpose. And that's something that Mitch McConnell has been doing in a really aggressive kind of fashion. So, so Clinton asked this really, I think it's an important question. It's a slippery slope question, um, which is, isn't the fear, isn't the, the fear, I think it's, he's asking, isn't the fear of changing the rules that opportunistic changes of the rules would lead to the elimination of all the other rules? In other words, is there, and Clinton, correct me if I'm wrong in chat, if I'm misrepresenting you, but I think what he's asking is, isn't, isn't that fear of the slippery slope, what is sort of preventing the any, any kind of material um, uh, revision of of the filibuster rules? I, I do think that I do think that that's a fear, right? I, mm -hmm. I do think, and it, it's related to what I said earlier, which is, you know, you do something now and you're not quite sure what it's going to do or how it's going to shape minority rights or whether you're going to be in the minority down the road. Um, so I do think there's some of that. And I do think, um, I, I, as I was um, poking around this morning, one of the things I wrote down and then I just didn't bring it in um, because they're violated all the time now was the role of norms. Mm -hmm as well right so normally speaking there are norms that and people expect certain things to be done in a certain way by a shared understanding and certain things not to be done we're in a moment of norm breaking and have been for quite some time um but you know i i think that's part of something part of what you need to consider now as well is the the absence of those norms which means yeah maybe there can be a total erosion of things um you know i i a couple of years ago, I went to see what the Constitution means to me on Broadway, and I don't. It's on um, one of the. I don't know if it's like Netflix or Prime or wherever it is. It's really worth seeing. Um, but one of the things that they do uh, towards the end of the show is have the audience vote on, um, and it's all about the Constitution. And they at the end they have the audience vote on whether we should keep the Constitution or get rid of the Constitution and redo it and do something different. And um, when I saw the show and they asked the question, I like gripped the arms of my chair <laughs> because part of me was like, no, it's the constitution, right? And if you make these kind of major changes, then not ah, anarchy. Um, the audience voted to dump the constitution, which is interesting. Uh, and, and many nights they did that. But what the reason I'm mentioning that is my initial impulse was no, it will unleash, a, you know, someone I saw use the word domino, you know, it, it will unleash crazy rampant change. But I did um, a public event, I don't know, a month or two months ago. And there's a, a historian, a political historian named Rachel Sheldon who used a phrase and I keep repeating I mentioned it last night during my event with Heather as well um constitutional creativity 
meaning that there have been moments when people have been able to be creative in the ways that they reform or shape the Constitution, not in a malicious way or necessarily a partisan way, but in a way of being willing to consider change. And, and we're not in that kind of a moment, and that might be better or worse. Um, but it's worth thinking about, right? Because I do think the initial impulse, and I totally confess that that's mine, you don't mess with the rules. You, know, you don't know what's going to be unleashed. And I don't think that's always true. So I'm going to say the last the last question for me, which is this. Okay. Um. Because because I think it's it 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 echoes what you're just talking about, and one of the uh, sort of underlying themes of our conversation today, and, and a lot of the, what you've highlighted, is that there are these political, governmental moments throughout our history where, um, where there has been a change to what we understand as the filibuster, whether it is started with Aaron Burr, whether it's 1837 when they finally did one, whether it's um, Reconstruction, right, which we didn't talk a lot about today, um, but that was one. And, and of course, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the, the changes in 1917. I don't know, so there's these moments. You talked about how right now we're kind of pushing back against norms and what we consider about norms. I'm wondering, do you view, view do you view what the the political historical moment that we're in now as part of that like and I know it's an unfair question but 50 years now from now will we look back on this particular moment as one of those historical moments where the filibuster was um at a crossroads I think we don't know that yet. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. I'm trying yeah, to walk well, you into because, it a different way. But, but because, right. you know, like I mentioned 2013 and, mm -hmm. you know, there have been moments where this has been debated before. Mm -hmm. um, what matters now, so we, we are seeing it used to an, ex or have been seeing it used to an extreme degree. So maybe in that sense, yeah. yeah People okay. will say like, you know, really? You know, in the book I just had, there'd be the paragraph that says, and then... <laughs> 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 there was Mitch McConnell who did this and that was, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I don't know, because, you know, I during my event last night with Heather um, Cox Richardson, she wanted to know we the, the, we ended by talking about whether we thought Biden was a, a game changing president. And she thought, yes. And I said, I, I joked, or I referred to this actually without using the name. I said, well, I'm not sure yet, because we're in a moment of extreme contingency right and i said the people who follow my webcast are going to know contingency comes in but i meant that because we, yeah. we have been in that moment and even though things have have shifted back into norms that we recognize we, we're not out of trouble and we don't know how things are going to go and it, it will it will behoove us to remain on our toes because i just don't know what's going to happen next uh and, and so certainly part of what i'm going to keep doing <laughs> <laughs> as a historian is saying that in a variety of ways over and over yeah, again yeah. don't don't let down your guard like be alert be watchful be good citizens you know think about what's happening whoever is in power um but we're at a weird moment so i think that's a, an appropriate way to kind of end our conversation today do you have any final thoughts about filibuster that we haven't covered yet um it's okay to say no why <laughs> I wanted to first. give you the opportunity before right, we I'm wrap thinking up. First. Um, and no, I guess I would only say that, um, and less about the filibuster than anything else. Um, you know, in, in thinking about um, what we talk about here on first Thursday and then Friday mornings, um, it, initially I was focused on forms of evidence and using how we look at forms of evidence to help us look at forms of evidence now, right? So what happens if you look at common people in the 18th century. Okay, what, what if you look at them now or, you know, and I, I shifted over time because I began to really feel that democracy was in danger and my topics became more focused on that. Um, and I still think that's true. So some of my discussions will still be about that, but I also feel that um, it might be possible to, to veer a little off in a different direction from time to time. She said nervously with her fingernail clutching to her desk. <laughs> um, but the reason why I mention that is um, if there are um, 
things you want to talk about that are um, slightly less linked to democracy that are about evaluating evidence or are which actually would be related to democracy. If mm -hmm. there are things that you're curious about that you want us to think about, um, as uh, Gina said, yeah, we ain't out of the woods by far. Um, but when I was thinking about what to talk about today and I the filibuster came to mind, I also thought, like, is there anything else that is maybe not about immediate death <laughs> that we could talk about? And the fact is, um, yeah, so uh, there could be. We're not, it's not, the death won't happen like in 10 minutes. So at any rate, what I'm saying in a very long wordy way is um, let Matt know, let me know, email us, tweet at us. Um, in one way or another, if there are things you're dying to talk about, let us know because I'd be really curious um, what those things are. Sherry said newbie did not weigh in today. Yeah, no, newbie, at, he just made a little chirp. Um, he, he's been, he burbled at the beginning and he made a couple of oodles when Matt was speaking. Um, <laughs> he, he likes male voices, but yeah, he's just been watching. He's been very quiet. I think he's still mad at me for moving him off to the side for my conversation. <laughs> Look at that. There he goes. <laughs> Thank you, newbie. I much appreciate that. I, I, he was really mad at me for moving him away from me last night when I was doing the Heather event. So anyway, I will stop things there. We will now move to the after party. Um, for those of you who are new uh, to History Matters, what that means is that we do not record. We turn off the recording. You can just stay right here if you want to stick around for the after party when we just have a more informal conversation. If you're on Facebook, to be part of the after party, you have to join the website, the link through the NCHE website to join the after party. But yep. we're just going to stick around for a while and have a, a conversation. Have, have a nice conversation. And and as always, if you do like what we do here at National Council of Education, please join us, www.nceteach.org, or uh, follow us on Twitter, which is at History Ed, or on Facebook, NC4HE, the number four, H-E. Um, is our, you can find us on Facebook. I do want to mention, I forgot to mention earlier on, we do have two great webinars next week. So oh. if you're looking for content, two great webinars. One is with the Stanford History Education Group on Tuesday. We're going to be talking about reading like a historian and using Sarah Vowell's talk as a mechanism for doing that. Um, and we're also partnering with the Choices Program to talk about the Haitian Revolution on Thursday. So either one of those, those are both great and you will get resources to use in your classroom. So please join us for that. And with that, I'm going to turn off the recording and we will enjoy the after party. Thank you guys, as always, for coming and being part of this conversation. Uh, and for those of you not sticking around for the after party, see you next week.